This is part four of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please listen with an open mind. Thank you for listening. Rings in the Moonlight. This section is devoted to several types of artifacts claimed by popular tradition to be of supernatural origin, such as fairy rings and saucer nests. Although such phenomena are treated as borderline cases by specialists in UFO investigation, I believe the nests deserve more than passing attention and should also be considered in the light of specific traditional beliefs about the meaning of the magic circles that for centuries farmers have found in their fields. The literature on this subject is abundant, and we shall select only a few cases to illustrate the point. On Thursday, July 28, 1966, in the evening, Mr. and Mrs. Lacoste were walking in the vicinity of Montserrat, Maine at Loire, France. All of a sudden, they saw a red sphere cross the sky like a meteor. It did not behave quite as a meteor, however, because it seemed to touch the ground and then rise again, and hover at mid-height for a while before it was lost to sight. A check was made for military experiments in the area. There were none. The next day, a Montserrat farmer, Alain Ruillet, reported that a nine-square-yard area of his wheat field had been flattened and covered with a yellowish, oily substance. Further investigation disclosed additional details on the identity of the witnesses and substantiated the idea that a peculiar object had indeed landed. Mr. Lacoste is a photographer in Saumur but, unfortunately, did not carry a camera with him at the time. He described the light given off by the sphere as being so intense that it lit up the countryside. The sphere hovered, he said, for a few seconds, then it maneuvered close to the ground. The witnesses felt sure it was a guided military gadget and walked to a distance about 400 yards from the object, which went away and was lost to sight behind some woods. The whole sighting had lasted four minutes. Six months earlier, a rash of similar sightings had made headlines in Australia. More flying saucer nests. Was the big news on the front page of the Sydney Sun Herald for January 23, 1966. Three nests had been discovered in Queensland circular clearings of dead reeds surrounded by green reeds. Hundreds of sightseers were searching for more by the time the reports were published. On January 19, 1966, at 9 a.m., a 27-year-old banana grower, George Pedley, was driving his tractor in the vicinity of a swamp called Horseshoe Lagoon when he suddenly heard a loud hissing noise. It sounded like air escaping from a tire, he said. Then, 25 yards in front of him, he saw a machine rising from the swamp. It was blue-gray, about 25 feet across and 9 feet high. It was spinning and rose to about 60 feet before moving off. It was all over in a few seconds, it moved at terrific speed, said Pedley. Then he found the first nest, with reeds flattened in a clockwise direction. The Sydney Sun Herald sent a reporter, Ben Davy, to investigate the sighting and it was discovered that dozens of people in the area had seen strange saucer-like craft similar to the one reported by Pedley, most of them before his sighting. Davy found a total of five nests and published the following description, I saw clearings in the reeds where they took off, and it was as everyone described it. In a circle roughly 30 feet in diameter reeds had been cut and flattened in a clockwise direction. One of the nests is a floating platform of clotted roots and weeds, apparently torn by tremendous force from the mud bottom beneath five feet of water. The second and third nest had been found, respectively, by Tom Warren, a cane farmer of Uramo, and Mr. Pinning, a Tully school teacher. They were about 25 yards from the first one, but hidden by dense scrub. In the third nest, which seemed quite recent, the reeds were flattened in a counterclockwise direction. All the reeds were dead, but they had not been scorched or burned, a patch of grass, about four feet square and three feet from the boundary of the first disc, had been clipped at water level, thereby adding a new element of the mystery. Altogether, the rings varied in diameter from eight to thirty feet. In all but the smallest, the reeds had been flattened in a clockwise direction. Policemen collected samples for tests, scientists came with Geiger counters, and the Royal Australian Air Force intelligence people were all over the place. Rumors circulated blaming the Soviets for using the vast open spaces of Australia to develop scientific ideas far ahead of the Americans. 
Why the Soviets could not conduct their secret testing in the vast open spaces of Siberia was not disclosed. Neither was it revealed why the pilots of the super-secret communist weapon could not resist the temptation to buzz the tractor of a 27-year-old banana grower in the capitalist world. Fortunately, there were several natural explanations for the sighting or the nest, although only one hypothesis, suggested by a Sydney Sun-Herald reader on January 30th, accounted for both. He believed the outer space panic in Queensland was caused by a tall shy bird with a blue body and red markings on the head. It was either a type of brolga or a blue heron, but the man did not know the correct scientific name. Many times, as he wandered barefooted through the bush, he said, he had seen the birds dancing, but they flew away at high speed before he could reach them, they would resemble a vaporous blue cloud and would certainly make a whirring sound in flight. Unfortunately for this pretty and imaginative theory, it got no backing from biologists. Museum ornithologist H. A. Disney thought the Brolgas could not make circular depressions of symmetrical design. He was similarly skeptical about the bald-headed coot theory advanced by another man, Galugong resident Ken Adams. I've never heard of this habit by the bird, Disney said. Researcher Donald Hanlon has pointed out that another explanation for the nest has been proposed locally, they are the playground of crocodiles in love. I fully share Hanlon's skepticism about this last explanation, because it could hardly apply to the nest found in Ohio, which will be discussed in a moment, or to the damaged wheat field in Montserrat. A Queensland resident, Alex Bordujinko, who knows about the crocodiles, claims the reeds are too thick in Horseshoe Lagoon for crocodiles to move through them. So here we are, dancing cranes are held responsible by some people for bending reeds that are so thick crocodiles, according to other people, cannot move through them. What really caused the damage? Nobody knows. On his way home that Wednesday night, George Pedley decided he would tell no one about the spaceship in the swamp. He saw neither portholes nor antennae on the blue-gray object and no sign of life either inside or about it. Furthermore, he had always laughed at flying saucer stories. But then he met Albert Panisi, the owner of Horseshoe Lagoon, and disclosed the sighting. He was very surprised when Panisi believed him right away and told him he had been dreaming for a week that a flying saucer would land on his property. This last detail places the Queensland saucer nests in the best tradition of the fairy faith. The time, six months before the Queensland experience. The place, Delroy, Ohio. On June 28, 1965, a farmer, John Stevano, heard a series of explosions. Two days later, he discovered a curious formation on the ground. When analyzed, soil and wheat samples showed no evidence of an explosion. Wheat plants seemed to have been sucked out of the ground, like the uprooted reeds in Queensland or the uprooted grass in a French landing of 1954 in Ponzi. The Ohio incident was carefully investigated by local civilian researchers. Akin Disso and Larry Moyers accompanied by Gary Davis. They found the strange circular formation on Stevano's farm, which is situated on a high point. At the center of the ring was a circular depression about 28 inches in diameter. It was probed with a pinch bar, but only loose soil was found for a depth of 9 inches. Much of the wheat had been removed, roots and all, and clods of soil a few inches long had been disturbed. The wheat was laid down like the spokes of a wheel, there was no swirling effects as in the Tully nests. If we turn from Australia and Ohio to England, we are faced with another incident. As reported in the Flying Saucer Review by editor Waveney Gervin, September 1963, July 16, 1963, will long be remembered in the annals of British ufology. Something appeared to have landed on farmer Roy Blanchard's field at the Manor Farm, Charlton, Wiltshire. The marks on the ground were first discovered by a farm worker, Reg Alexander. They overlapped a potato field and a barely field. The marks comprised a saucer-shaped depression or crater 8 feet in diameter and about 4 inches in depth. In the center of this depression there was found a 3 feet deep hole variously described as from 5 inches to 1 foot in diameter. Radiating from the central hole were 4 slot marks, 4 feet long and 1 foot wide. The object must have landed, if land it did, unseen, but Mr. Leonard Joliffe, a dairyman on the farm, reported he heard a blast one morning at approximately 6 a.m. on July 23, 
the London Daily Express was to report that nearly two weeks earlier, on July 10th, Police Constable Anthony Penny had seen an orange object flash through the sky and vanish near the Manor Farm field. On the basis of this limited information, it would seem quite plausible to think that the Charlton crater was caused by a meteorite. Indeed, when a small piece of metal was recovered from the hole at the center of the crater, British astronomer Patrick Moore went to the British Broadcasting Corporation and stated categorically that the crater had been caused by a shrimp-sized meteorite, crashing down and turning itself into a very effective explosive. This ended the mystery as far as the scientific public was concerned. But the actual facts of the matter, as they became known to a few scientists who pursued it, and to the army engineers who were in charge of the investigation, were altogether different. Farmer Roy Blanchard sent for the police, who, in turn, summoned the army. Captain John Rogers, chief of the Army Bomb Disposal Unit, conducted most of the field investigations. His preliminary report indicated no burn or scratch marks, no trace of an explosion. And while Captain Rogers stated that he and his superiors were baffled, Farmer Roy Blanchard made further disclosures, there isn't a trace of the potatoes and barley which were growing where the crater is now. No stalks, no roots, no leaves. The thing was heavy enough to crush rocks and stones to powder. Yet it came down gently. We heard no crash and whatever power it uses produces no heat or noise. Then, on July 19th, it was reported that Captain Rogers had obtained permission to sink a shaft. The readings obtained were rather unusual. They indicated a metallic object of some size, deeply embedded. And it was further learned that detectors behaved wildly, presumably because the metallic piece in question was highly magnetic. At this stage, it should be pointed out, the investigation was still open and above board, possibly because the Army, rather than the British Air Ministry, was involved. And the Army Southern Command Public Relations Officer at Salisbury told Gervin that the object was recovered from the hole. It was sent to a British museum expert and promptly identified as a piece of common ironstone, which could be found buried all over southern England. The British Museum suggested that it had been in the ground for some time, thus eliminating the idea of a hoax. And Dr. F. Claringbull, also of the museum, destroyed the meteorite explanation and, according to the Yorkshire Post of July 27, stated, There is more in this than meets the eye. The last word stayed with Southern Command, However, and it commented wisely, the cause of the phenomena is still unexplained but it is no part of the Army's task to unravel such mysteries. If we try to summarize what we have learned from these incidents, the Tully Nest, the Ohio Ring, and the Charlton Crater, we can state the following. 1. Public rumor associates sighting of flying saucers with the discovery of circular depressions on the ground. 2. When vegetation is present at the site, it exhibits the action of a flattering force which produces either a stationary pattern, spokes of a wheel, or a rotating pattern, clockwise or counterclockwise. 3. Some of the vegetation is usually removed, sometimes with the roots, leaves, etc. 4. The effect of a very strong vertical force is often noticed, as evidenced by earth and plants scattered around the site. 5. Strong magnetic activity has been found in one instance, where common ironstone was buried close to the center of the depression, and, 6, a deep hole, a few inches in diameter, is often present at the center. Do I need to remind the reader of that celebrated habit of the elves, to leave behind them strange rings in the fields and prairies? One Sunday in August, as he wandered over the hills of Hoth, Evans once met some local people with whom he discussed these old tales. After he had tea with the man and his daughter, they took him to a field close by to show him a fairy ring, and while he stood in the ring, they told him, yes, the fairies do exist, and this is where they have often been seen dancing. The grass never gets high in the lines of the ring, for it is only the shortest and finest kind that grows there. In the middle, fairy mushrooms grow in a circle, and the fairies use them to sit on. They are very little people, and are very fond of dancing and singing. They wear green coats, and sometimes red caps and red coats. On November 12, 1968, the Argentine press reported that near Nicaquia, 310 miles south of Buenos Aires, a civilian pilot had reported a strange pattern on the ground and investigated it with several military men. Walking to the spot, 
where a flying saucer was earlier alleged to have landed, they found a circle six yards in diameter where the earth was calcined. Inside this circle grew eight giant white mushrooms, one of them nearly three feet in diameter. In Santa Fe province, other extraordinary mushrooms have been discovered under similar circumstances. Another writer, reporting on Scandinavian legends, noted that elves are depicted there as beings with oversized heads, tiny legs, and long arms, they are responsible for the bright green circles, called elf dawns, that one sees on the lawns. Even nowadays, when a Danish farmer comes across such a ring at dawn, he says that the elves have come there during the night to dance. It is amusing to note that attempts have been made, in the early days of rationalism, to explain fairy rings as electrical phenomena, a consequence of atmospheric effects. P. Maranzino, for example, quotes a little couple by Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of the English naturalist Charles Darwin, written in 1789, so from the dark clouds the playful lightning springs, rivers the firm oak or prints the fairy rings. And Erasmus Darwin adds, there is a phenomenon, supposed to be electric, which is not yet accounted for, I mean the fairy rings, as they are called, so often seen on the grass. At times larger parts of prominences of clouds gradually sinking as they move along are discharged on the moisture parts of the grassy plains. Now the snob or corner of a cloud in being attracted to the earth will become nearly cylindrical, as loose wool would do when drawn out into a thread, and will strike the earth with a stream of electricity perhaps 2 to 10 yards in diameter. Just the external part of the cylinder burns the grass. The formulation of this idea in terms of modern plasma physics will no doubt soon be provided by eager scholars. They would do well, however, to note the diameter of the cylinder mentioned by the elder Darwin, 2 to 10 yards, the diameter of the average UFO. Angels or devils? We have already noted several instances connecting unknown beings with the theft of agricultural products. Lavender plants, grapes, or potatoes seem to have been taken away with equal dexterity by the mysterious little men. In story after story, from North and South America and from Europe, the creatures are seen alighting from their shiny craft, picking up plants, and taking off again before amazed witnesses. Such behavior is well designed to make the investigators of such stories assume that the visitors are gathering samples with all the care and precision of seasoned exobiologists. Are we not, after all, designing robots that will continue analysis of the Martian surface begun when the Viking probe reached that planet? In a few cases, the visitors even take the time to interview the witnesses at length concerning agricultural techniques. Such was the case in a 1964 landing that, curiously enough, took place in Tioga City, New York, on the very day of the Socorro landing, about 10 hours before Officer Zamora observed the egg-shaped, shiny object so familiar to us now. Gary T. Wilcox, a dairy farmer, was spreading fertilizer in his field. Sometime before 10 a.m., he stopped to check a field surrounded by woods, about a mile away from his barn. He wanted to see whether ground conditions would allow plowing. As he approached the field, however, he saw a shiny object that he first took to be a discarded refrigerator, then a wing tank or some other aircraft part. When he drew closer, he realized that the object was egg-shaped and about 20 by 16 feet, had the appearance of durable metal, and did not look like anything he had ever seen before. He touched it. It was not hot. He observed no door or hatch of any kind, and yet two human-like creatures suddenly appeared. They were about four feet tall and wore seamless clothing, with headdress and a full face hood that did not allow Wilcox to observe any facial features. They appeared to have arms and legs. They talked to him in smooth English, but their voices did not come from their heads, as far as Wilcox could tell, but from their bodies. Do not be alarmed, we have talked to people before. We are from what you people refer to as Planet Mars, they said. In spite of Gary's conviction that someone must be playing a gag on me, the strange conversation continued. The two beings were interested in fertilizers and expressed considerable interest in their use. They stated that they grew food on Mars, but that changes in the environment were creating problems they hoped to solve by obtaining information about our agricultural techniques. Their questions were quite childlike, and they appeared to have no knowledge of the subject whatever. Each one carried a tray filled with soil. 
When they talked about space or the ship, I had difficulty in understanding their explanations. They said they only travel to this planet every two years and they are presently using the Western Hemisphere, Wilcox reported. They explained that they landed only during daylight hours, because their ship is less readily visible in daylight, and they said they were surprised Wilcox had seen their craft. They also volunteered information about space travel. Our astronauts would not be successful, they said, because their bodies would not adapt to space conditions. Finally, they requested a bag of fertilizer but, as Wilcox walked away to get it, the craft took off, disappearing from sight in a very few seconds. The witness left a bag of fertilizer at the place, the next day it was gone. In many of the South American landings, entities have been described walking away with soil samples, plants, even boulders. Everything in their behavior seems designed to make us believe in the outer space origin of these strange beings and their craft. And, indeed, such absurd incidents have greatly influenced the researchers, including myself, who have seriously thought that the UFOs were space probes sent by an extraterrestrial civilization. On November 1, 1954, Mrs. Rosa Lottie Danethley, 40 years old, was going to the cemetery at Poggio d'Ambra, Bucine, near Arezzo, Italy. A devout Italian woman, she was carrying a pot containing flowers. Her mind at that moment must have been far from science fiction speculation, yet what happened to her in the next minute constitutes perhaps the strangest of the entire wave of 1954 incidents. As Mrs. Lottie Danethley walked past an open grassy space, she saw a vertical, torpedo-shaped machine with pointed edges, a machine, in other words, shaped like two cones with common bases. In the lower cone was an opening through which two small seats were visible. The craft looked metallic. It did not resemble anything the witness had seen before. From behind the object, two beings appeared. They were three and a half to four feet tall. They looked joyful. Their smiles displayed white and very thin teeth. They were wearing gray coveralls and reddish leather helmets similar to those used by military drivers. They had what seemed to be a convexity at the center of their foreheads. Speaking an incomprehensible language, the two closed in on the woman, and one of them took the pot containing the flowers. Mrs. Lottie Danethley now tried to get her property back, but the two beings ignored her and returned to their craft. The witness started to scream and ran away. She returned to the spot with other witnesses, including policemen. Too late. Not a trace of the object was left. But it seems that other people saw the craft in flight, leaving a red and blue trail. These stories would be amazing and nothing more if it were not for one fact known to students of folklore. A constant feature of one class of legends involving supernatural creatures is that the beings come to our world to steal our products, our animals, and even, as we shall see in a later chapter, human beings. But for the moment, let us concern ourselves only with the sample gathering behavior of these beings and their requests for terrestrial products. In an Algonquin legend embodying all the characteristics of an excellent saucer story, a hunter beholds a basket that comes down from heaven. The basket contains twelve young maidens of ravishing beauty. The man attempts to approach them, but the celestial creatures quickly re-enter the basket, which ascends rapidly out of sight. However, witnessing the descent of the strange object on another day, the same hunter uses a trick to come close to it and succeeds in capturing one of the girls whom he marries and by whom he has a son. Nothing, unfortunately, can console his wife for loss of the society of her sisters, who have gone away with the flying vehicle. One day she makes a small basket, and according to Hartland, having entered it with her child she sang the charm she and her sisters had formerly used, and ascended once more to the star from whence she had come. She had been back in that heavenly country two years when she was told, Thy son wants to see his father. Go down therefore, to the earth and fetch thy husband, and tell him to bring us specimens of all the animals he kills. She did so. And the hunter ascended with his wife, saw his son, and attended a great feast, at which the animals he brought were served. The Algonquin story offers a complex mixture of themes. Some of them are present in modern day UFO stories, others derive from traditional concepts, such as the exchange of food. The new elements are, 1. The desire expressed by the celestial beings to receive specimens of all the animals the hunter kills, 
and, two, the idea that sexual contact between the terrestrial and the aerial races is possible. So far, we have seen our visitors stealing plants and requesting various items, but have they actually killed animals themselves? Have they taken away cattle? If we are to believe the stories told by many witnesses, they have. But the interesting fact is that, here again, we find a trait common to both the UFO knots and the good people. Crowds of elves have been seen chasing cows and horses. And in the same conversation with Walter Evans Wentz, recorded before 1909, the storyteller, Old Patsy, told the following story about a man who, if still alive, is now in America where he went several years ago, in the South Island as night was coming on, a man was giving his cow water at a well, and, as he looked on the other side of a wall, he saw many strange people playing Hurley. When they noticed him looking at them, one came up and struck the cow a hard blow, and turning on the man cut his face and body very badly. The man might not have been so badly off, but he returned to the well after first encounter and got four times as bad a beating. On November 6, 1957, 12-year-old Everett Clark, of Dante, Tennessee, opened the door to let his dog Frisky out. As he did so, he saw a peculiar object in a field a hundred yards or so from the house. He thought he was dreaming and went back inside. When he called the dog twenty minutes later, he found the object was still there, and Frisky was standing near it, along with several dogs from the neighborhood. Also near the object were two men and two women in ordinary clothing. One of the men made several attempts to catch Frisky, and later another dog, but had to give up for fear of being bitten. Everett saw the strange people, who talked between them like German soldiers he had seen in movies, walk right into the wall of the object, which then took off straight up without sound. It was oblong and of no particular color. In another of the tantalizing coincidences with which UFO researchers are now becoming familiar, on the same day another attempt to steal a dog was made, this time in Everettstown, New Jersey. The name of the town in the second case is almost identical to that of the witness in the first. While the Clark case had taken place at 6.30 a.m., it was at dusk that John Trasco went outside to feed his dog and saw a brilliant egg-shaped object hovering in front of his barn. In his path he met a being three feet tall with putty-colored face and large frog-like eyes, who said in broken English, We are peaceful people, we only want your dog. The strange being was told in no uncertain terms to go back where he belonged. He ran away, and his machine was seen to take off straight up some moments later. Mrs. Trasco is said to have observed the object itself from the house, but not the entity. She is also quoted as saying that when her husband tried to grab the creature, he got some green powder on his wrist, but that it washed off. The next day he noticed the same powder under his fingernails. The euphonaut has been dressed in a green suit with shiny buttons, a green tam shanter like cap, and gloves with a shiny object at the tip of each. Whether the creatures come down in flying saucers or musical baskets, whether they come out of the sea or the rock, is irrelevant. What is relevant is what they say and do, the trace each leaves in the human witness who is the only tangible vehicle of the story. This behavior presents us with a sample of situations and human reactions that trigger our interest, our concern, our laughter. Joe Simonton's pancake story is cute, the tales of fairy food are intriguing but difficult to trace, the rings and the nests are real, but the feeling they inspire is more romantic than scientific. Then there is the strange being's desire to get hold of terrestrial flora and fauna. The stories quoted in this connection verge on the ludicrous. But to pursue the investigation further leads to horror. This is a facet of the phenomenon we can no longer ignore. Perhaps I have succeeded in evoking a new awareness of a parallel between the rumors of today and the beliefs held by our ancestors, beliefs of stupendous fights with mysterious supermen, of rings where magic lingered, of dwarfish races haunting the land. In this chapter, I have limited the argument to the mere juxtaposition of modern and older beliefs. The faint suspicion of a giant mystery, much larger than our current preoccupation with life on other planets, much deeper than mere reports of zigzagging lights, perhaps we should try to understand what these tales, these myths, these legends are doing to us. What images are they designed to convey? What hidden needs are they fulfilling? If this is a fabrication, why should it be so absurd? 
Are there precedents in history? Could imagination be a stronger force to shape the actions of men than its expression in dogma, in political structures, in established churches, in armies? If so, could this force be used? Is it being used? Is there a science of deception at work here on a grand scale, or could the human mind generate its own phantoms, in a formidable, collective creation mythology? Man's imagination, like every known power, works by fixed laws. These words by Hartland, written in 1891, offer a clue. Yes, there is a deep undercurrent to be discovered and mapped behind these seemingly absurd stories. Emerging sections of the underlying pattern have been discovered and mapped in ages past by long-dead scholars. Today we have the unique opportunity to witness the reappearance of this current, out in the open, colored, naturally, with our new human biases, our preoccupation with science, our longing for the promised land of other planets. A new mythology was needed to bridge the stupendous gap beyond the meaningless present. They are providing it. But who are they? Real beings, or the ghost of our own dreams. They spoke to us in smooth English, they did not speak to our scientists, they did not send sophisticated signals in uniquely decipherable codes as any well-behaved alien should before daring to penetrate our solar system. No, they picked Gary Wilcox instead. And Joe Simonton. And Maurice Mass. What did they say? That they were from Mars. That they were our neighbors. And, above all, that they were superior to us, that we must obey them. That they were good. Go to Valensol and ask Mass. He will tell you, perhaps, as he told me, how puzzled he was when suddenly, without warning, he felt inside himself a warm, comforting feeling, how good they were, our good neighbors. The good people. They took a great interest in the affairs of men, and they always stood for justice and right. They could appear in different forms. With them Joe Simonton exchanged food. So, in times gone by, did Irishmen, who talked to similar beings. In those days, too, they were called the good people and, in Scotland, the good neighbors, the slea maith. What did they say, then? We are far superior to you. We could cut off half the human race. It does begin to make sense. These were the facts we have missed, without which we could never piece the UFO jigsaw together. Priests and scholars left books about the legends of their time concerning these beings. These books had to be found, collected, and studied. Together, these stories presented a coherent picture of the appearance, the organization, and the methods of our strange visitors. The appearance was, does this surprise you, exactly that of today's UFO pilots? The methods were the same. There was the sudden vision of brilliant houses at night, houses that could fly, that contained peculiar lamps, radiant lights that needed no fuel. The creatures could paralyze their witnesses and translate them through time. They hunted animals and took away people. In the Magic Casement, a book edited by Alfred Noyes about 1910, I find this little poem by William Allingham, which I invite all ufologists to learn as a tribute to Joe Simonton, up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a hunting for fear of little men, we folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap, and white owl's feather. Down along the rocky shore some make their home, they live on crispy pancakes of yellow tide foam, some in the reeds of the black mountain lake, with frogs for their watchdogs, all night awake. 3. The Secret Commonwealth We are progressing, step by step, in a forest of reports and facts obscured by speculations and theories. I am trying to clear the underbrush. In the previous two chapters, order has begun to emerge. It is reassuring to find the phenomenon follows certain laws, however bizarre, and that it has puzzled our ancestors as much as it challenges us. It would be a grave mistake to believe that we, in the late 20th century, are the first people smart enough to recognize that the phenomenon is worthy of investigation and obeys certain fixed patterns. I have devoted considerable time to collecting, studying, and reconstructing the detailed accounts that were aviable to serious researchers of the previous centuries and to retracing their steps. That they were scholars in theology and natural philosophy, rather than people trained in science, does not bother me. They applied the same principles. They started from stories that were reported to them, 
they visited the witnesses to form a personal opinion about the report, and when they were safely home, in the peace of their monastery or study, they compared the observation to those they had already gathered. They have pulled ancient books from dusty shelves just as I have. They opened Celis alongside Paracelsus and were to seek the guidance of those who preceded them. It would have been as easy for them to jump to premature conclusions as it is for us to declare that UFOs are extraterrestrial visitors. They could have claimed the creatures came from the moon or were the denizens of hell. Remarkably, they kept an open mind. And they transmitted to us a surprisingly clear and fresh statement of the things seen in the sky and on the land for centuries, accounts that read like the modern reports of UFOs and alien abductions. One of these researchers, Reverend Kirk, who lived in Scotland in the late 17th century, has even left us a list of 16 concise, precise conclusions about the form of intelligence that controls the phenomenon, and the organization of the entities themselves. He calls that organization the secret commonwealth. The ghost and the teletype. The teletype message arrived in Dayton, Ohio, on September 9, 1966, through military channels. The full text, about four pages long, was quite unintelligible without knowledge of the Air Force procedure for the transmission of UFO reports. This particular message had originated at Kelly Air Force Base, Texas, and was addressed to the Air Force Systems Command, Headquarters, U.S. Air Force, and the Secretary. It bore the headline Unclassified Routine and the title UFO Report is submitted in accordance with AFR 202. Kelly Air Force Base was sending something very close to a ghost story. The report made reference to two separate incidents, occurring, respectively, on August 6 and September 3, 1966, in a small Texas town. The author of the report is a father of four children. We shall call him Robert. His house is located in a fairly isolated spot, and he has never discussed the incidents with his neighbors. On August 6, the three youngest children, ages 6 to 9, noticed a dark object shaped like an upside-down cup. Although it was afternoon, the children had not seen the object arrive. These details, naturally, were not given spontaneously by the children, the story was reconstituted during the investigation, it was dark, without color and without lights. Then a square yellow light appeared, like a door opening, and a small creature was seen in the square of light. The entity, three to four feet tall, was dressed in black clothing that reflected a yellow or gold color. The observation lasted several minutes, then the door closed. A low humming sound became audible, and the object took off toward the northeast, rising sharply but at an unexceptional speed. At no time did the object touch the ground, it hovered at a height of about 15 feet, near a tree, which was found undamaged, about 35 feet from the house. The second sighting took place on September 3rd, most of the family had gone away, but the oldest daughter had remained in the house with a friend. They were watching television in the afternoon when the set snowed, then went out. The house was lit up with eerie red and yellow light which appeared to be circling or twirling. They looked outside and saw an object hovering in the same position, by the same tree, as in the first sighting. Its shape, again, was that of an upside-down cup, with a flat disc beneath, like a saucer. It was covered with light and departed shortly afterward. No sign of life was apparent inside or outside the craft. Two days later, Robert was propped up in bed. Through his door and across the hall he could see a dark doorway leading to his son's bedroom. All of a sudden he saw a small person, three and a half to four feet tall, dressed in white, tight-fitting clothes, enter the dark bedroom. He assumed it was his small daughter going in to talk to her mother, who was in the room with his sons. About ten minutes later he saw something like a bar of light, which appeared to crumble. He got up and went to the room, where he found his wife and the boys, who had also seen the bar of light. He did not see the person in white leave, and his wife stated that their daughter had not been in the room at any time. There was no physical evidence to substantiate the presence of the small person in the house. The rocks were full of them. On the island of Aramore, a man named Old Patsy, whom we met in Chapter 2, told Walter Evans once a true story about the fairies, twenty years or so ago around the bed of Dermot and Grania, just above us on the hill, there were seen many fairies, crowds of them and a single deer. They began to chase the deer, 
and followed it right across the island. At another time similar little people chased a horse. The rocks were full of them, and they were small fellows. Another person told Evans Wentz, My mother used to tell about seeing the fair folk dancing in the fields near Cardigan, and other people have seen them around the Cromlech up there on the hill. They appeared as little children in clothes like soldiers' clothes and with red caps, according to some accounts. Now, since we are getting to the central idea of this book, I will quote two more stories, both of them landing reports from the richest period in UFO history in terms of number of landings reported, autumn 1954. Both stories come from France. The first case took place on October 9th. Four children living in Pornoy Lachative, Moselle, reported that at about 6.30 p.m., as they were roller skating, they suddenly saw something luminous near the cemetery, it was a round machine, about 2.5 meters in diameter, which was standing on three legs. Soon a man came out. He was holding a lighted flashlight in his hand and it blinded us. But we could see that he had large eyes, a face covered with hair and that he was very small, about four feet tall. He was dressed in a sort of black sack like the cassock M. Le Cure wears. He looked at us and said something we did not understand. He turned off the flashlight. We became afraid and ran away. When we looked back we saw something in the sky, it was very high, very bright and flew fast. The second case is a classic. It happened on Sunday September 26, in Shaboyle, Drome. At about 2.30 p.m. Mrs. LaBeouf was gathering blackberries along a hedge when, the dog began to bark and then started howling miserably. She looked around and saw the little animal standing at the edge of a wheat field, in front of something that she thought at first was a scarecrow, but going closer, she saw that the scarecrow was some kind of small diving suit, made of translucent plastic material, three feet tall or a little taller, with a head that was also translucent, and suddenly she realized that inside the diving suit was a thing, and that behind the blurred transparency of the helmet two eyes were looking at her, at least she had the impression of eyes, but they seemed larger than human eyes. As she realized this, the diving suit began to move toward her, with a kind of quick, waddling gait. At this point, Mrs. LaBeouf fled in terror and hid in a nearby thicket. When she tried to locate the entity, there was nothing to be seen, but all the dogs in the village were furiously barking. All of a sudden, a large metallic, circular object rose from behind some trees and took off toward the northeast. People who had heard the witnesses' cries soon gathered around her. At the site where the disc had been seen to rise, a circle was found, about ten feet in diameter, where shrubs and bushes had been crushed. From one of the acacia trees at the edge of the circular imprint hung down a branch more than three inches thick, broken by pressure from above. The branch of another acacia, which hung over the circular mark eight and a half feet above the ground, was entirely stripped of its leaves. The first few yards of wheat, in the path of the object as it took off through the field, were flattened out in radiating lines. I hardly need underline the similarity between the depression left by this object and the various kinds of rings or nests already mentioned. Let us now return to the Fians, the dwarfish race that accompanies the Corrigans, the fairies of Brittany. They are seen only at twilight or at night. Some carry a torch like a Welsh death candle. They have swords no bigger than pins. According to French author Ville Marc, a careful distinction should be drawn between Corrigans and dwarfs. The latter are a hideous race of beings with dark or even black hairy bodies, with voices like old men and little sparkling black eyes. A man who wrote to me after reading one of my books pointed out that although he was unconvinced about the existence of the unidentified flying objects, he had discovered something he thought might be of interest to me. And he continued thus, I have spent several years doing research on the Cherokee Indian, which is a branch of the Iroquois tribe. When the Cherokees migrated into the hills of Tennessee they came upon a strange race of Moonite eyed people who could not see in the daylight. The Cherokees being unable to understand these wretches expelled them. Barden in 1797 states these people were a strange white race, far advanced, living in houses. Haywood, 26 years later, states the invading Cherokees found white people near the head of Little Tennessee with forts extending down as far as the Chickamauga Creek. He gives the location of three of these forts. 
Confirmation of my correspondence report is found in Robert Silverberg's excellent book Mound Builders of Ancient America, The Archaeology of a Myth. It would be nice to hold on to the common belief that the UFOs are craft from a superior space civilization, because this is a hypothesis science fiction has made widely acceptable and because we are not altogether unprepared, scientifically and even, perhaps, militarily, to deal with such visitors. Unfortunately, however, the theory that flying saucers are material objects from outer space manned by a race originating on some other planet is not a good answer. However strong the current belief in UFOs from space, it cannot be stronger than the Celtic faith in the elves and the fairies, or the medieval belief in Luton, or the fear throughout the Christian lands, in the first centuries of our era, of demons and satyrs and fauns. Certainly, it cannot be stronger than the faith that inspired the early contributions to the Bible, a faith that seems rooted in personal experiences regarded as angelic visitation. Those who assume that modern UFO sightings must be the result of alien experiments, of a scientific or even super-scientific nature, conducted by a race of space travelers may be the victims of their ignorance of the old folklore. The academic pedants, through a common bias that psychologists could perhaps explain if they were not its first victims, have covered the fairy faith with the same ridicule as other pedants now cover the UFO phenomenon. Such tales set in motion powerful mental mechanisms making acceptance of the facts very difficult. The facts in question ignore frontiers, creeds, and races, defy rational statement, and turn around the most logical expectations as if they were mere toys. It is difficult to come to grips with the UFO phenomenon. Although it clearly evolves through phases, its effects are diffuse. We have to rely on legends, hearsay, and extrapolations. Evans Wentz, as we have seen, found several people in Celtic countries who had seen the gentry or had known people who were taken by fairies. In Brittany, he had much greater difficulty. The general belief in the interior of Brittany is that the fees once existed, but that they disappeared as their country was changed by modern conditions. In the region of the Mene and of Erche, Il at Vilen, it is said that for more than a century there have been no fees and on the sea coast where it is firmly believed that the fees used to inhabit certain grottoes in the cliffs, the opinion is that they disappeared at the beginning of the last century. The oldest Bretons say that their parents or grandparents often spoke about having seen fees, but very rarely do they say that they themselves have seen fees. M. Paul Sibillet found only two who had. One was an old needlewoman of St. Cast who had such fear of fees that if she was on her way to do some sewing in the country and it was night she always took a long circuitous route to avoid passing near a field known as the Couvent des Fees. The other was Marie Chehu, a woman 88 years old. The central question in the analysis of the UFO phenomenon has always been that of the controlling intelligence behind the object's apparently purposeful behavior. For the time being, let me simply state again that the modern, Global belief in flying saucers and their occupants is identical to an earlier belief in the good people. The entities described as the pilots of the craft are indistinguishable from the elves, sylphs, and luton of the Middle Ages. Through the observations of unidentified flying objects, we are concerned with an agency our ancestors knew well and regarded with awe. That we is the end of dimensions, the of the a casebook of alien contact part Can three. we establish with a certainty that the two Belay. beliefs are indeed Please identical? Please proceed to part four I believe before we YouTube can. deletes it. I have already Thank given several listening. examples of the means of transportation used by the sylphs. The ability of the gentry to cross the continents cannot have escaped the reader's attention. But I have not yet drawn from popular folklore the stories that support most directly the idea that strange flying objects have been seen throughout history in connection with the little people. Let us clear up this point now. Aerial races, Barfadets and Slimaith. As late as 1850, one race of Luton survived in France, in the region of Poitou, which has been in recent years a favorite landing area for flying saucers. The Luton of Poitou were known as Farfadets, and the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris contains several delightful accounts of their mischievous deeds. What were the main characteristics of the Fadets or Farfadets? They were little men, very black and hairy. All day long they lived in caves, and at night they liked to get close to the farms. The literature reports that their favorite pastime was to play tricks on terrified witnesses. Their dwellings were located with some precision. See Puico, 
for instance, has reported in a lecture that Farfadets lived for a long time at La Boulardier near Turfs, du Sevre, in underground tunnels. At La Boissière, the inhabitants described the Fadets as hairy dwarfs who played all sorts of pranks. One night in the 1850s, near the shore of the Ygre River, a group of women talked outside until about midnight. As they were returning to the village, they had just crossed a bridge, they heard a terrible noise and saw something that froze their blood. Some object, which, for lack of a better term, they called a chariot with whining wheels, was speeding up the hill with a marvelous velocity. It was pulled by the Farfadets. The terrified women hung together as they saw the apparition. One of them, although half dead with fear, made the sign of the cross. The strange chariot leapt up over the vineyard and was lost in the night. The women hurried home and told the story to their husbands, who decided to investigate. They bravely went to the spot as soon as the sun was up. Of course, there was nothing left to be seen. We have already been told of the traveling habits of the good people. What has not yet been mentioned is the belief, especially in Ireland, that human conditions are related to the travels of the good people. Evans Wint says that, according to John Glenn, town clerk of Tuam, during 1846-47 the potato crop in Ireland was a failure and very much suffering resulted. At the time, the country people in these parts attributed the famine to disturbed conditions in the fairy world. Old T.D. Stead once told me about the conditions then prevailing, sure, we couldn't be any other way, and I saw the good people and hundreds besides me saw them fighting in the sky over Knockmog and on towards Galway. And I heard others say they saw the fighting too. According to another popular Irish belief, the elves have two great feasts each year. The first one takes place at the beginning of spring, when the hero O'Donoghue, who used to reign over the earth, rises through the sky on a white horse, surrounded by the brilliant company of the elves. Lucky is he, indeed, the Irishman who sees him rise from the depths of the Lake of Killarney. In another part of Europe, in January 1537, the people of Franconia, between Paben Burp and the forest of Thuringia, saw a star of marvelous size. It came lower and lower and appeared as a large white circle from which whirlwinds and patches of fire came forth. Falling to earth, the pieces of fire melted spearheads and ironwork, without causing harm to human beings or their houses. The favorite abode of the gentry, however, was not always an aerial one. In many tales related by the students of folklore, as in the modern literature of UFOs, the strange beings often come from the sea. Thus Evans once learned, there is an invisible island, between Innismurray and the coast opposite Grange on which part of the gentry is supposed to reside. When it is visible it is only visible for a short time. In the legends of Europe, it is between the 8th and the 10th centuries that celestial prodigies were most often visible. But the books on magic and demonology associate supernatural beings with celestial signs. A strange category of devils called Friday demons is thus described in the magical works of Henri Cornet Agrippa. These devils are of medium height, rather handsome. Their arrival is preceded by a brilliant star. According to the Western Kabbalists, the sylphs flew through the air with the speed of lightning, riding a peculiar cloud. It is noteworthy, too, that in France some fairies are supposed to bear a luminous stone, an object that is often part of the equipment of flying saucer occupants. Many a little man has a light on either his belt, chest, or helmet. In a French tradition that survives in modern novels, the fortunate mortal who can steal the fairy's luminous stone is sure of lifelong happiness. On June 17, 1790, near Alençon, France, there was an apparition so strange and so disturbing that police inspector Lybief, who witnessed the events in the presence of a doctor, the mayors of two nearby towns, and three other officials, was instructed to make a thorough investigation. His report reads, in part, at 5 a.m. on June 12, Several farmers caught sight of an enormous globe which seemed surrounded with flames. First they thought it was perhaps a balloon that had caught fire, but the great velocity and the whistling sound which came from that body intrigued them. The globe slowed down, made some oscillations and precipitated itself towards the top of a hill, unearthing plants along the slope. The heat which emanated from it was so intense that soon the grass and the small trees started burning. 
the peasants succeeded in controlling the fire which threatened to spread to the whole area. This sphere, which would have been large enough to contain a carriage, had not suffered from the flight. It excited so much curiosity that people came from all parts to see it. Then all of a sudden a kind of door opened and, there is the interesting thing, a person like us came out of it, but this person was dressed in a strange way, wearing a tight-fitting suit and, seeing that crowd, said some words which were not understood and fled into the wood. Instinctively the peasants stepped back, in fear, and this saved them because soon after that the sphere exploded in silence, throwing pieces everywhere, and these pieces burned until they were reduced to powder. Researchers were initiated to find the mysterious man, but he seemed to have dissolved. Let us follow the strange beings across the world now, to Mexico, where an American anthropologist, Brian Strauss, reports that the Tzeltal Indians have strange legends of their own. One night, Strauss and his Indian assistant discussed these legends of the Ikuls, the little black beings, after seeing a strange light wandering about in the Mexican sky. The Ikuls are three foot tall, hairy, black humanoids whom the natives encounter frequently, as Strauss learned, about twenty years ago, or less, there were many sightings of this creature or creatures, and several people apparently tried to fight it with machetes. One man also saw a small sphere following him from about five feet. After many attempts he finally hit it with his machete and it disintegrated, leaving only an ash-like substance. The beings were also observed in ancient times. They fly, they attack people, and, in the modern reports, they carry a kind of rocket on their backs and kidnap Indians. Occasionally, Strauss was told, people have been paralyzed when they came upon the Ikuls, who are said to live in caves, which the natives are careful not to enter. Gordon Creighton, editor of the Flying Saucer Review, a linguistic expert, and a former diplomat with the British Foreign Service, had occasion to study Indian folklore during several stays in Latin America. Commenting on Strauss's report, Creighton pointed out that words such as ID and Ikul were found in all the dialects of the Mesoc linguistic group, that subtle words Ike and Ikul, the adjective form, simply mean black being or black, in the Maya language, we find that Ik means air or wind, and Ikul means a spirit, while Ik means black. The Kekshi Maya, in the Alta Vera Paz region of Guatemala, talk of a Kek. The Kek, meaning black in the Kekshi dialect of Maya, is said to be a centaur-like being that guards his patron's house at night, and frightens people at dusk. Black, ugly, hairy, he is half-human, with human hands but the hooves of a horse. The Mexican legends show, quite conclusively, that many, perhaps every, region of the world has its own traditions about such creatures and associates them very definitely with the idea of supernatural origin. In the Tzeltal cosmology, the earth is flat and supported on four columns. At the base of these columns lives a race of black dwarfs, and Creighton points out that their blackness is due, so runs the Indian theory, to being scorched by the sun when it passes close to them every night as it travels through the underworld. According to the Paiute Indians, California was once populated by a superior civilization, the Havmasuvs. Among other interesting devices, they used flying canoes, which were silvery and had wings. They flew in the manner of eagles and made a whirring noise. They were also using a very strange weapon, a small tube that could be held in one hand and would stun their enemies, producing lasting paralysis and a feeling similar to a shower of cactus needles. How could primitive tribes better describe the same phenomenon reported in our own time by people like Maurice Mass? It is interesting to gather such tales in America. In Europe, the archives of the Roman Catholic Church are full of such incidents, and it cannot be doubted that many accusations of witchcraft stemmed from the belief in strange beings who could fly through the air and approach humans at dusk or at night. Occasionally, these demons were seen in full daylight by many people. And in this context, I am not referring to the vague confessions obtained under torture from the poor men and women who fell into the clutches of the Inquisition, although this material would be quite worthy of a parallel study. I am quoting official records of the time, gathered from and witnessed by clerics and policemen, of which the following is typical. In the early 17th century, the cathedral at Camper Quarantan, France, had on its roof a pyramid covered with lead. On February 1, 1620, between 7 o'clock and 8 p.m., thunder fell on that pyramid, 
and it caught fire, exploded, and fell down with a stupendous noise. People rushed to the cathedral from all parts of the town and saw, in the midst of the lightning and smoke, a demon of a green color with a long green tail, doing his best to keep the fire going. This account, which was published in Paris, is supplemented by a more complete version printed in Wren. This latter version adds that the demon was seen clearly by all, inside the fire, sometimes green, sometimes blue and yellow. What were the authorities to do? They threw into the roaring fire a quantity of blessed objects, close to 150 buckets of water, and 40 of 50 carloads of manure, to no avail. The demon was still there, and the fire kept burning. Something drastic had to be done, a consecrated host was placed inside a loaf of bread and thrown into the flames, and then blessed water was mixed with milk given by a nurse of above reproach conduct and spread over the demon and the burning pyramid. This the visitor could not stand, he whistled in a most horrible fashion and flew away. I can only recommend the recipe to the U.S. Air Force, if they can find a nurse with the right qualifications. 800 years earlier, that is, about 830, in the days of Emperor Lothair, creatures similar to the elementals were often seen in the northern parts of the Netherlands. According to Cornel van Kempen, they were called white ladies. He compares them to nymphs of antiquity. They lived in caves, and they would attack people who traveled at night. The shepherds would also be harassed. And the women who had newly born babies had to be very careful, for they were quick in stealing the children away. In their lair, one could hear all sorts of strange noises, indistinct words that no one could understand, and musical sounds. That is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of Alien Contact Part 4. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to Part 5, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.